Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. So our speaker today is Stephanie McKnight, who is an endangered species conservation biologist with the Xerces Society, and she's located in Oregon. She works on West, the Western population of monarch butterflies, including the development of best management practices for monarchs and pollinators on public lands. She completed a Bachelor of Science in Botany at Oregon State University. And before working with the Xerces Society, she worked as a botanist with the U.S. Forest Service in California and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Oregon. So with that, I'll let Stephanie take over and tell us about monarchs and milkweeds in New Mexico. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, hi, everybody. Like she said, my name is Stephanie McKnight. I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. For the last four years, my work is focused on Western monarchs. Um, and so with that, I'm going to jump in and get started. So today's topics, I'm going to cover monarch life history overview. I'm going to go over the milkweed species that occur in New Mexico. And I'm going to talk about the monarch population status, both the Eastern and Western monarch populations. I'm going to talk about threats to monarchs and then how you can get involved in monarch conservation. Just a little bit about the Xerces Society. We are an international nonprofit dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat, in case you haven't heard of us before. We were founded in the 1970s in response to the um, extinction of a small blue butterfly called the Xerces blue butterfly that went extinct to human causes. And since that time, we've expanded to include four different main conservation programs that focus on pollinators, endangered species, aquatic conservation, and pesticides. So if you want to learn more about the Xerces Society after this webinar today, you can check out our website at xerces.org. So getting to know monarchs and milkweed. So monarchs occur in a lot of places all over the world, um, but today what we're really focusing on is the population that is native to the Americas. So primarily North America and Mexico. Um, monarch butterflies undergo a true long distance migration in both the Eastern US and the Western US. They utilize internal compasses that sense the sun and the Earth's magnetic field and they're often encouraged to migrate in response to changes in day length. Um, so in North America, there are multiple generations of monarchs that breed throughout the US and into Southern Canada. Um, and generally we talk about there being an Eastern population and a Western population that's more or less divided by the continental divide. So in general, we talk about the Western population as being those monarch butterflies that breed in states West or in areas west of the Continental Divide or the Rocky Mountains, and then overwinter um, either on the California coast or in Mexico. And the eastern population is generally those butterflies that breed east of the Rocky Mountains or the Continental Divide, and then overwinter in Mexico. New Mexico, in general, the state of New Mexico kind of includes both populations. So it includes the Continental Divide and includes land both um, on the west side of the Continental Divide and on the east. So when we talk about a Western monarch, um, which generally includes parts of New Mexico, we are talking about, like I said, those butterflies that breed west of the Rocky Mountains and then primarily overwinter at groves of trees along the California coast. Um, we know what a Western monarch is um, and we know where they come from, um, from tagging efforts and isotope, isotope studies. So tagging efforts are basically um, where scientists will, or um, people will affix a small little uh, sticker or tag to the hind wing of a butterfly and then let it go. And then that tag has a unique ID and can be recovered later on so that we know the migration path of that butterfly. Um, and for the Western United States, you can see um, those lines, the either blue or green lines showing the path of a butterfly. And you can see for New Mexico, that there are only two recoveries so far of tagging and those, both of those recoveries um, both went to Mexico. So we have not yet documented a butterfly from New Mexico going to the California overwintering sites yet. Um, we also know that the butterflies that overwinter on the California coast come from all over the Western US from isotope studies. So that's the graph that you see in the middle showing that butterflies sampled on the California coast come from all over uh, the Western US. 
And then a similar study was done in the eastern U.S. as well by Flockhart. Um, and you can see on that map that the butterflies overwintering in Mexico originate from all over um, the eastern U.S. and into Canada. So like I said, we've learned about migration pathways of monarch butterflies through tagging efforts. And these tagging efforts, which is sticking a little sticker onto the hindwing of the butterfly to be able to determine where it goes, um, is how we discovered that the monarchs overwinter in um, Oyamal fir forests in Mexico in the 70s, which is really neat. Um, since then, uh, tagging efforts in the Western US have been ongoing by uh, some programs um, such as the Southwest Monarch Study, where we've learned that butterflies in the Western US have been documented going to both Mexico and to California. And like I said, no tag recoveries yet from New Mexico to California, but it's always possible. So in general, monarchs start um, the migration in late summer and fall. So actually right now is the beginning of the migration back to overwintering sites. Um, we know that the uh, eastern and western populations are more or less genetically indistinct, although some more recent studies have shown that there are some slight genetic differences because the western population of monarch butterflies faces different environmental stressors. There are two kind of differences between the eastern and western populations, and the biggest is that We've learned through recent research with um, the University of our, or Washington State University with Dr. Cheryl Schultz that the population in the West is an expanding population, whereas the population in the Eastern US is more of a shifting population. And what I mean by that is the monarch butterflies in the East generally migrate up from Mexico to start the breeding season. And as the breeding season moves on, they move north and um, in latitudinal bands, which is shown in those different colors in the east on the map. Um, and so they continue to move north uh, as the breeding season um, continues, whereas in the uh, west, um, the population is more of what we call an expanding population. So as they leave overwintering sites, they expand out into breeding regions, but then remain in those regions. They don't shift to new regions further inland or further north. However, New Mexico is sort of unique in that it actually has breeding throughout the season. So it's different than Texas um, because it, it generally has breeding throughout the year. So I would say New Mexico falls more in that expanding um, population and is more closely, um, or is more similar to the Western population in that way. So monarch overwintering habitat, both on the California coast and in Mexico, are these very specific um, groves of trees that have of the Goldilocks conditions. So they have very specific microclimate conditions that allow the butterflies um, to spend an entire winter without being exposed to harsh conditions such as freezing temperatures or wind. So these, these groves of trees have very specific conditions that allow the butterflies to expend very little energy and survive the winter months um, to be able to expand back out into breeding areas uh, in the early spring. And in California, there are overwintering sites all along the Pacific coast and into northern Baja, California, or Baja, Mexico. In the west, um, there's breeding habitat for monarchs in every single state. Um, basically, wherever there is milkweed, um, monarchs have been found using that milkweed. Um, and we are continuing to learn more about monarch breeding in the western United States, including in New Mexico, as we gather more records. Um, this, these two maps show uh, the increase in records that we've been able to amass through the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. So the map on the right is data that we have currently from 2020, and the map on the left shows the data that we had in 2014. And sorry, that map on the left kind of cuts off New Mexico. But at the map on the right, you can see um, there's quite a bit of, of milkweed and quite a lot of monarch records for New Mexico and all over the West. So monarchs breed basically everywhere in, in the Western United States and throughout all of uh, US and into Southern Canada. So to jump into the monarch life cycle, um, in general, monarchs are, are specialists. So they require milkweed plants to complete their life cycle. Adults um, lay eggs generally singly on the underside of leaves for the most part, although they will lay eggs on basically any part of the plant I've seen it laid on flowers and flower buds and on the stem, pretty much anywhere. Um, but 
more often it's on the underside of the leaves. Um, that egg stage lasts about three to five days before it hatches into um, a larvae or what some people call caterpillar. Um, and that stage lasts about 10 to 14 days where they go through different instars. They grow through five different instars where they grow from a tiny, tiny little first instar all the way through a large fifth instar um, before becoming a chrysalis um, and then emerging as an adult. And this whole life cycle process, um, like I said, requires milkweed plants or plants in the genus Asclepius and takes about one month um, for the whole process to take place before they emerge as an adult. Like I said, this is what the eggs look like. They're sort of like this oblong shaped um, light yellow color with little ridges. Um, so if you go out and you find a milkweed plant, you can check the leaves and stems to see if you can find um, these really tiny little eggs. They can be seen um, with just the naked eye without any assistance, but some people find it easier to use a small hand lens. Um, and then before they hatch, they turn this dark color and that dark color is actually the head of the first instar. And so you can kind of see the head of the first instar before it hatches. So it'll turn this dark color. And then, like I said, they go through these different instars um, before turning into a chrysalis and then emerging as an adult. Um, kind of neat when they first emerge as an adult, they sort of look all crumpled up and um, basically, the adult will then pump all the fluid that's in its abdomen into the wings so that the wings are then rigid and it can fly, which it's a really neat process if you haven't been able to see it before. Um, monarch males and females differ. So males on the top side of the wing have these little tiny black dots on the hind wing, which you can see that are circled in yellow. And females don't have those dots, and they generally have thicker uh, black bands that you can see on the hind wing. So if you compare the, the hind wing, those dark black lines are much thicker on the female than they are on the male, and then the male has those little dots. Um, in the West, there are, or in New Mexico, there are also monarch lookalikes, and the two most common that you're most likely to encounter are the queen butterfly, which are all the pictures on the bottom there. Um, queens are very similar to monarchs in that they use Asclepius or milkweeds as hosts as well, um, so they can be easily confused. Um, one of the easiest ways to tell the difference is that the, the larvae or caterpillar have an extra set of appendages. So you can see in that picture on the lower left, there is a third set of appendages um, in the middle of the, the larvae. Um, and another way is by the adults. So if you look at the adult picture, um, if you look on the hind wing, on the lower hind wing, you can see little white dots um, on, the hind wing, on the hind wing and also on the forewing. So there are more white dots on the queen butterfly than there are on a monarch. And that is one of the best ways to tell the difference. Another species that um, can be easily confused with the monarch is the viceroy. And viceroys generally use willow trees um, in riparian areas for the most part as their host. So you often see them in similar habitats, especially in New Mexico where milkweed is very common in riparian areas. Um, viceroys can be easily confused because they, they grow in, uh, or live in a similar habitat type. But the difference is that the viceroy has this, um, this black line through the hind wing, as you can see. And if you compare that to the picture of the monarch, you'll see that the monarch doesn't have that black line. Viceroys are also quite a bit smaller than monarch butterflies. And so if you see an orange butterfly and you think, ooh, that might be a monarch, you can also just tell that it's, it's much smaller and then it has that very distinct line through the hind wing. So like I said, monarchs are, are specialists and they require milkweed plants to complete their life cycle. So the larvae feed on milkweed exclusively and they concentrate toxic cardenolide compounds that make the the larvae toxic to predators um, and they accumulate those compounds and so they require um, milkweed to complete their life cycle as in, in immature stages but they're also really fantastic nectar resources for the adults and for other insects as well. So now I'm going to talk about identifying milkweed plants. They have really unique flower structure and the best time to really be able to identify them and to notice them um, is when they're in bloom because their flowers are often quite showy and really beautiful. 
Um, another key identifying feature of a milkweed plant is that, like their name suggests, they have this milky sap. So in the picture in the lower right hand corner, you can see that when the vegetation is disturbed, it ex the plants exude this white um, milky latex is what it's called. Um, they also have very distinctive fruit pods. So the majority of milkweeds have these very lar enlarged seed pods that are also very distinctive. They have really interesting pollination biology as well. So um, in order to pollinate a milkweed, insects basically have to land on the flower and their legs get stuck in what are called the stigmatic slits. And in those slits are these really neat structures that contain pollinium. And um, if you look at the diagram um, in the lower right here, you can see that the pollinium are attached to this corpusculum, which are basically these little appendages and the insects stick their legs in there, and then these structures with the pollinium attached, which contain the pollen of the plant, get stuck to their little legs. And then the insect will fly off to another flower and basically transfer it to the stigma, which is really cool. And actually kind of morbid, but sometimes insects get their legs stuck in there and they can't get out and they will die. So sometimes you'll see milkweed plants that have dead insects on them, um, and that's just, it's just something that happens, um, but uh, sometimes people ask me, they, they found dead honeybees on a milkweed plant and they're worried that it was from an insecticide or a pesticide, but more often than not, it's just that the honeybee or the insect got their legs stuck in the flower and couldn't get out and unfortunately died. Um, but anyway, milkweeds have these really cool flower structures that um, I hope that all of you joining today can get out and look at a milkweed plant and investigate the flower structure for yourself to be able to see this. So milkweeds are perennials, which means that they grow for multiple seasons and then they die back in uh, late summer or uh, fall and then reemerge the next year. They have these really cool pods that usually split open at maturity, as you can see in the picture here, and then release their seeds, which are wind blown. And so they have this really cool uh, material called floss uh, that basically makes them blow in the wind. And if you've ever seen this happen in the fall when all the milkweeds pods are splitting open and the wind comes up and just blows just, you know, huge tornadoes of milkweed seeds around, it can be a pretty cool thing to see. In the West, there's such a huge diversity of milkweed species. And if you look at this map, you'll see that Arizona and New Mexico have the highest diversity of milkweed species in the Western US. Um, so lucky you in New Mexico, you have so many cool different milkweed species that you could potentially encounter. Um, in all of North America, there are about 72 species um, and about 44 species, depending on who you talk to, occur in the Western US. And like this map shows, there are 29 species in New Mexico. Monarchs have been documented using um, a large number of these, and I would expect that monarchs probably use any milkweed plant they can find. It's just that we just don't have enough data to say they use all of them yet. So if you're out and about and you encounter a cool rare milkweed, I encourage you to look for um, monarch eggs and larvae. And if you do see any, to report it to uh, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper so that we can learn more about which monarch or which milkweed plants in New Mexico are used as monarch host plants. So here are the native species of milkweed plants in New Mexico. Um, I'm not going to read off every single one, um, but this, uh, this table can be found in a best management practices for monarchs in the West document that's, that we'll send out tomorrow in a link after the webinar. Um, and then on the right here, I have another graph that just shows the relative abundance of the different species. So the top four most common species I'm going to talk about here in a second. Um, the first is horsetail milkweed, so Asclepia subverticillata. Um, this is one of the most abundant plants and the most common milkweed species that you're probably most likely to encounter. They have these long, narrow leaves and sort of white flowers um, that are pretty dense in a cluster on top. So these flowers are much smaller than the showy milkweed or common milkweed that most people are familiar with. Um, but monarch butterflies use this plant very regularly as a host. They incur in a wide variety of habitats um, and a wide variety of, of elevations. Um, so it's very likely that you, if you have gone out looking for milkweeds in, in New Mexico, that you've encountered this plant. 
The second most common uh, species in New Mexico is spider milkweed or Asclepius asperula. Um, this one also occurs in a wide variety of habitat types, um, but is generally more at higher elevations and monarchs also have been documented using this one. It's beautiful. The flowers are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, the next most common species is broadleaf milkweed. So it looks a little different than the last two, has much broader, wider leaves. And the flowers are a little less conspicuous, um, kind of a whitish color. Um, these ones are pretty common along roadsides and in dry washes um, and occur on, across a wide variety of elevation. Um, and then the fourth most common species in New Mexico is the butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. And this one is just absolutely beautiful. It's great for gardening. So if you are interested in planting a milkweed in your yard, um, tuberosa is a great one for that. Um, this one occurs in a wide variety of habitat types, but is generally in, um, in pretty rocky areas and along roadsides. Um, and monarchs also use this one. Um, there are also four rare milkweed species in New Mexico. So these ones are really cool, sort of more desert uh, focused species. Uh, the four are Asclepius nemularia, Ruthiae, Samuanensis, which only occurs in one county in New Mexico, which is really neat and then Asclepius uncialis. And if you wanna learn more about these four rare milkweed species, I'm not gonna to provide too many details about them because they are rare and we wanna protect them, um, but you can learn more at, at the link here. Um, Xerces also uh, developed along with Monarch Joint Venture and some other partners, these really great roadside milkweed guides that um, are available on our website. And these include um, these great little overviews of, of both distribution maps of where these milkweed species occur and some little quick ID uh, tips to figure out which milkweed species you might be looking at. Um, so these milkweed guides are available for all regions of, of the US, um, but I've pulled out the one that covers New Mexico. Um, so like I said, this is available on the Xerces website. I always like to point out that um, we often hear about milkweed being super important for monarch butterflies, but they're also really great plants for other pollinators and insects and even uh, hummingbirds and moths. Um, there are also specialist herbivores, such as this really cool longhorn um, red beetle in the lower left-hand corner that consumes milkweed um, vegetation. Uh, and hummingbirds use it as a nectar source. Um, and uh, some birds have been documented using that seed floss that I showed a picture of earlier to build their nests out of. Um, so milkweed's super important for a lot of other in, um, pollinators and birds. Uh, and so I just like to point that out. You can see this picture on the left is showing milkweed and there are so many different species of bees and a wasp using it. And um, oftentimes when you find a milkweed plant, they're just covered in insects and um, they're really great additions to gardens or any natural area because of that. There are also these other plants that are in the milkweed family in New Mexico that are super cool. Um, they're in the same family, like I said, the Apostinaceae, and all these pictures I took off iNaturalist, and so you can see the number of observations in New Mexico listed under the picture. Um, Monarchs have been documented using some of these plants as a host, um, but for the most part, they don't use them very often, um, and they generally prefer um, actual milkweed plants or plants in the Asclepius genus. However, I think it's important to point out that there are these other cool plants that look very similar to milkweeds. They have similar flower structure, um, but they're actually more like vining plants, so uh, they have a different growth habit than milkweeds. Um, so if you want to learn more about those, uh, the genus of most of them is Funastrum, or um, the Texas milk vine, Matalea, um, is also in New Mexico. Um, there are also, there's also a non-native species, which I'm not sure if it's, it's all that uh, widely available in New Mexico in nurseries, but uh, tropical milkweed is probably one of the most common species sold in nurseries. Um, for gardening and uh, we encourage people to plant native milkweed instead of tropical milkweed for a variety of reasons, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. So as you can see from the map here, this map was taken from the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. 
Um, monarchs and milkweed occur all over New Mexico. Um, they can be found in pretty much every county uh, and have been documented in every county historically, although this map does not show that. Um, but like I said, milkweed can occur occurs pretty much all over the state. So no matter where you may uh, reside in New Mexico, you can probably go out and hopefully find a milkweed plant and look for monarchs. So monarchs, like I said, occur uh, throughout New Mexico in many different habitat types um, and up to 8,000 feet in elevation, which is really cool. Um, they usually arrive in March or April and then expand throughout the state throughout the rest of the breeding season and until about September or October when they start to migrate back to overwintering sites. Um, and then they'll remain, they remain in the state. Like I said earlier, the Western population is more of an expanding population. So instead of a shifting population. So in Texas, it's generally much lower elevation and much hotter and the butterflies will generally move into Texas and then move out as the breeding season continues. But New Mexico is a little bit different because it's the fourth highest state. So there's a lot of high elevation habitat um, with milkweed plants where the butterflies go to instead of leaving the state, they just go to higher elevations as the season progresses. Um, Monarchs also have been documented using river corridors during migration in New Mexico. Um, so that might be a really good place to go look for them. Not only that, um, there are a lot of different milkweed species that occur in those river corridors as well. Um, the southeast corner of the state has, uh, is part of what's the so-called Texas Monarch Flyway. So this is where you can see um, hundreds or thousands of butterflies during the peak migration in both the spring and the fall. Um, and of course, this all depends on, on um, every year is different. And um, so I can't point out exactly where you can go to see these, but um, in the fall, there can, there have been some fall roost sites. So where the migrating monarchs will stop and uh, spend a night, for example, all clustered together in one tree or a, a group of trees. Um, in their migration route back to Mexico. Um, I've never seen one of these, but I've seen pictures and um, I hope some of you joining in today have a chance to go out and look for some of these this fall. Um, it seems like a, a, good, a good chance that some may form this year. Um, but yeah, so the, the southeast corner of the state has also been identified um, by Steve Carey, who is a lepidopterist in New Mexico, is sort of a, a monarch hotspot. So Carlsbad Caverns has been identified as having lots of monarch activity. Uh, both milkweed um, look for monarchs. Um, this map is a map taken from this really great report that I encourage you all to check out after this webinar. It's called Monarch Butterfly in New Mexico and a Proposed Framework for its Conservation. And this publication was developed by Stephen Carey and Linda DeLay, DeLay um, in 2016. And it, it contains a, an awesome overview of monarchs in New Mexico. And this map shows sort of like the um, the peak months for monarchs in different counties in New Mexico. And this, I included the fall um, map because that's the season that we're in right now and upcoming. And so you can see uh, the peak uh, for August, September, and October. Um, and you can see that that southeast corner of the state or the southern part of the state is where you're going to sort of see the peak um, monarch numbers in the next month or so. Um, and like I said, this, this publication is available online if you just search for it. And I highly encourage everybody joining in to, to check it out. Um, like I mentioned, there are those fall roost sites and Journey North, um, which is a online community science platform um, that tracks the monarch butterfly migration every year. It's, they have great real-time migration maps. They also track um, fall roost sites for where monarch butterflies seem to be aggregating in the fall during migration. And this is a map showing the, the roost sites from 2019 on Journey North. And as you can see, the red dots show where people reported roost sites. And so it's mostly that southeast corner of the state where you're most likely to see them. So I'm gonna talk about the monarch population status. 
um, now that we have a firm understanding of monarch life history and milkweed plants in New Mexico. So the Eastern and the Western monarch populations have both undergone massive declines um, since the 1980s. In Mexico, the way that the population is assessed is by documenting the total hectares of area that's occupied by overwintering monarchs. So it's basically counting the area covered by monarch butterflies um, on trees uh, in Mexico at overwintering sites. And as you can see, that population has declined um, quite uh, quite a lot since the 80s. Um, in the 80s, there were about 18 hectares of area covered by, um, actually, sorry, in the 90s, there were about 18 hectares of, of area occupied by monarchs overwintering in Mexico. And then in the last, win last winter, 2019-2020, there were only 2.83 hectares. The Western monarch population is assessed a little bit differently. We actually, it's actually a direct count of or an estimate of the actual number of individual monarchs at an overwintering site. We, there's a huge group of volunteers that goes out annually um, during the Thanksgiving count to count the number of butterflies uh, on trees. Um, and the Western population has declined by about 99% since the 1980s. There used to be an estimated four and a half million monarchs that would overwinter on the California coast annually. And the last two years, we've only had around 29,000 butterflies. So four and a half million to 29,000, pretty shocking. And that's despite, as you can see on this graph on the right, the, that's despite an increase in the number of sites that we've been monitoring. So um, the last two years, you can see we've counted um, almost, like, over 250 sites, but yet we still only found 29,000 butterflies. So like I said, they've declined by over 99% since the 1980s. Um, that's like the town of Los Angeles shrinking to the size of Monterey in California. Um, or for every 160 monarchs that there were in the 1980s, there's now only one. Um, there's a projected 99% probability of quasi-extinction of the Western monarch migratory population in the next 50 years. And um, researchers have suggested a 30 that 30,000 butterflies is a quasi-extinction threshold. And for the last two years, the count on the, in the West has been below that quasi-extinction threshold. So Western monarchs have declined a lot and are in, are in trouble. Um, like I said, the way we assess the Western monarch population is primarily through the Western monarch count, which includes the Western monarch Thanksgiving count and the New Year's count are two counts that occur annually during the overwintering period on the California coast and into northern Baja. Um, we can also get a, a, a pulse on the western monarch population through some breeding season surveys that have been done by researchers, um, most notably Art Shapiro's long-term butterfly monitoring transects that have been taking place in California, and then some other research. Um, some other ways that we know about the uh, Western monarchs is through community science projects such as Journey North, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, um, Monarch Joint Venture has a new monitoring program called the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, and then the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. I'm going to talk about all of these programs a little bit later. So in response to the massive decline of the Western monarch population, the Xerxes Society and other researchers and biologists um, put together what's called the Western Monarch Call to Action. And this is a set of rapid response conservation actions that can help the Western Monarch butterfly uh, bounce back from its extremely low 2018 to 19 population size. There are five key components to the call to action. The first is to protect and manage California overwintering sites. So those groves of trees along the California coast that are, have the specific microclimate conditions that allow the butterflies to survive the winter months. The second is to restore breeding and migratory habitat in California. So when, once those butterflies leave those overwintering sites in the spring, they need to be able to find milkweed. Um, and we think those early season milkweeds in California might be limiting. And so that first generation of monarchs in California is super important. And so um, the second is to restore that breeding habitat for, for butterflies for that first generation. The third thing is to protect monarchs and their habitat from pesticides. Fourth is to protect, manage, and restore summer breeding and fall migration habitat outside of California. So that includes New Mexico. Um, and then to answer key research questions about how best to aid Western monarch recovery. 
So why are monarchs in trouble? So like many declining species, they face so many different threats and it's difficult to tease out what may be the most important thing contributing to the decline of monarch butterflies. And this applies to both the Eastern and the Western population, although I'm talking primarily about the Western population threats today. So some of the main things include loss and degradation of overwintering habitat and pesticides. Um, some recent research shows that those are sort of the two that um, seem to stand out as being the most likely contributors, although um, loss and degradation of breeding and migratory habitat, climate change, um, including drought and wildfires, uh, incre increased wild and severity of wildfires, and then disease, parasites, and predation also contribute to the decline of the population. Like I said, that loss and degradation of my breeding habitat, it may also be due to um, limiting early season milkweed. So milkweed that's available in the early spring. Um, nectar and roost habitat might be limiting. And then, like I said, climate change, uh, such as severe storms and fires. So because monarch butterflies tend to aggregate in uh, very small locations, whether that's in Mexico or on the California coast, because they're all aggregating in these single locations, they're more prone to uh, extirpation or local extirpation from a severe storm, for example, or a wildfire that could wipe them all out because they're all stuck in one place, basically. Um, and then disease parasites and predation. In particular, um, OE is a disease that affects monarch butterflies, um, or it's also called Ophiocystis electrocera. Um, and that uh, disease is more prevalent in areas with tropical milkweed where it doesn't die back uh, in the winter months. So we know that um, milkweed was historically abundant in agricultural fields um, in the Midwest in particular and in the Eastern US. And some researchers have found that there's been a massive decline of milkweed in the Midwest. Um, so for the Eastern population, um, due to uh, herbicide resistant corn and soy crops. So crops where you can just go in, they're resistant to herbicide and spray herbicide over the top of it. And there used to be a lot more milkweed that would grow in these agricultural landscapes that monarchs would use um, for breeding. But because of these um, herbicide resistant crops um, that can be treated with uh, herbicides, um, there's been a loss of milkweed. In the West, it's less clear whether or not milkweed has been lost, um, but we do know that um, there's high, been a high herbicide use in areas that we have identified as, as being um, highly suitable for monarch breeding and milkweeds in the West. And so it can be assumed that there's probably been a loss of, of breeding habitat in the Western United States as a result of, of herbicide use. Insecticides are our, a huge problem for um, all invertebrates, um, but monarch butterflies also. Um, so this picture shows a bumblebee die off um, of landscape trees in Oregon, I believe, uh, where an insecticide was applied to trees. And then unfortunately, all of these bumblebees were killed. So any insecticide application, for the most part, they're broad, they're, they affect any invertebrate, um, many of them. And so any invertebrate that is present will be killed. Um, in particular, systemic herbicides such as neonicotinoids. Um, basically, they're systemic, so they remain in the tissue of plants, um, including some milk that can be found in milkweed plants sold in some nurseries, um, have been documented as killing monarch butterflies, even if it's just in the tissue. There's a new study that was um, conducted by the Xerces Society and researchers at the University of Nevada, Reno recently that found that all milkweed plants sampled in the Central Valley of California in a variety of land use types. So whether it was a wildlife refuge or a farm or an urban area or um, milkweed plants from a plant nursery, all of them were contaminated with pesticides. So every single milkweed sample collected in California was contaminated with at least one pesticide, but the most of them had multiple pesticides. And like I said, these were milkweed plants taken from a variety of of different landscapes, um, including wildlife refuges, places where you wouldn't expect there to be a lot of um, pesticides. Um, and so 
pesticides are clearly a really big problem for monarch butterflies. If a wild milkweed plant just growing in a wildlife refuge may have pesticides, then it seems pretty likely that that could be having an effect on the monarch butterfly population in the West. And this research was just recently published um, and can be found on the Xerces website. Climate change is also a huge problem. This is the drought forecast right now for the Western United States. Um, and some, there are a lot of areas in extreme drought, and these, including in New Mexico, and these areas are also hotspots for monarchs. So we don't know exactly how this affects the monarch population, but it can be assumed that these areas experiencing extreme drought may be more prone to severe wildfires, which obviously would reduce um, existing breeding and migratory habitat for monarchs, um, and just in general may just reduce nectar availability, especially right now for monarchs that are trying to migrate back to overwintering sites. Um, like I mentioned, overwintering habitat loss uh, and degradation is a huge problem, not just in the Western United States, but also in Mexico. So loss of the groves of trees where monarch butterflies spend the winter, um, whether that's due to uh, deforestation or from climate change or due in California, it's more common that it's um, loss of these sites due to development. There's also just a huge number of disease, parasites, and predation of monarch uh, eggs and caterpillars. So only one to ten percent of eggs and caterpillars in the wild actually survive uh, to become adults. Um, there are birds that will eat the caterpillars um, and adults as well. Birds at overwintering sites eat the adults, um, which is really interesting. I think it's um, black-headed grosbeaks in uh, Mexico will actually consume the adults. They basically rip open the abdomen and eat them. It's pretty, pretty morbid. Um, there are tachinid flies that lay their eggs inside of the, the larvae. Um, praying mantid, like the picture that I took in the middle here, a praying mantid is eating a, a fifth in star monarch larvae. Um, and then there's the well-studied parasite, OE, um, which reduces migration success, causes um, deformation of the wings, which is this picture on the left, um, and reduces likelihood of migration. So there are so many things facing the monarch butterfly uh, and so many reasons for decline, but the good news is that there's something that we can all do um, to help uh, save monarch butterflies in North America. Um, and it will take a, it's going to take a huge effort of federal agencies, of nonprofits, of just anybody in the community of farmers, teachers, community scientists, and hopefully all of you joining today can take some steps to be able to help save the monarch butterfly in North America. So how can we help monarchs? Um, so I'm gonna start off by just talking and going over real quick about what monarchs need before we can talk about how we can help. Um, so, what do monarchs generally need? They need food and water. So they need milkweed host plants, which we talked about before, all of those really cool milkweed plants in the genus Asclepius. Um, they need diverse nectar sources. So the adults require nectar to fuel them through the breeding season and during migration. They need fresh water, and then they need shelter, both during the breeding season, they need shelter from wind or extreme um, heat. Uh, and they need roof sites uh, at overwintering sites as well. And then they need protection from pesticides. So we can all help contribute to creating and restoring monarch butterfly habitat, whether it's in your backyard or in a local community garden or get your city um, on board to protect any existing um, milkweed plants that might be, exist in the city or uh, to plant milkweed or native nectar resources so that monarch butterflies have that uh, wherever anybody lives, you can contribute something. So the main thing we can all do is to just protect and plant native milkweed. Um, you can find local nurseries where you live by using the milkweed seed finder. I think right now only one nursery in New Mexico is registered under the milkweed seed finder as having native milkweed plants, um, but I encourage you to reach out to your local plant nurseries to see if they stock native milkweeds. And if they don't, you should ask them to. <laughs> um, 
or to you can find existing milkweed populations where you live by using the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper website. There's an interactive map and you can zoom into wherever you live and see where milkweed has been documented previously. The next main thing that we can all do is to, to plant and protect native flowers. So adults require a lot of, of native nectar or of nectar to, to fuel their migration and fuel the adults during the breeding season so they can find mates and new habitat to expand to. Um, there are a variety of plants. Monarch adults are generalists, so they'll use pretty much any, any flower they can land on. Um, and, and can actually stick their proboscis, which is their, their long tube-like tongue that they stick into flowers to feed. Um, right now, the most important species in New Mexico are native sunflowers, um, seep willow or bakaris, which grows in riparian areas, and then rabbit brush. Those are some of the three sort of more common species that monarchs generally use right now in New Mexico during the migration. Um, so those are good places to go look for monarchs right now if you are um, able to get out during COVID and, and actually go out and look at flowers wherever you, you might be. Um, those are species to really look at because that's those are species that are blooming right now and that monarchs really, really like. So the Xerces Society has uh, regional monarch nectar plant guides for the entire um, U.S. Um, for New Mexico, the two guides that are um, applicable to the state include the Rocky Mountain Guide, which is mostly just the very northern part of the state, and then the Monarch um, Nectar Plants for the Southwest, which includes most of New Mexico. Um, these guides were developed using um, known or plants that have been documented as being used by monarch butterflies. So we have, the Xerces Society manages a huge nectar database of observations of monarchs um, using plants so that we were able to develop these lists using that data. So these are plants that we know monarchs will use and have been documented using. Um, they're also species that are commercially available. So that means plants that are available um, to buy seed or plants or plugs of so that you can use them for restoration or to plant in your in your yard or garden or keep in a pot on your on your patio or on your balcony or um, in your window. Um, they're hardy and appropriate for large scale restoration. And then they're, of course, it's important that they're actually in bloom during the time a monarch is in that region. So these guides can be downloaded as PDFs um, and used, or they can also just be viewed online at the Xerces website. One thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to go out and go to a nursery and find native milkweed, or uh, flowering plants that you think might provide nectar to, to monarchs is to be sure that the, the plants weren't treated with insecticides because a lot of plants um, in nurseries have been treated with insecticides and we know that some of these can be lethal to monarch butterflies and other pollinators. So um, I encourage you all that if you go to a nursery to buy plants um, for pollinators that you ask the nursery if they use neonics um, or other insecticides so that you know the plants that you're buying are free from insecticides before you bring them home and plant them. And one thing to keep in mind is, like I said earlier, some of these insecticides are uh, systemic, which means that even if a plant was sprayed with an insecticide and you think, oh, it's been watered, the, the insecticide is washed off, a lot of these insecticides get integrated into the tissue of the plant, so it's still in the tissue. Um, so it's important to make sure you ask and if you have a nurse, if your local nursery does use insecticides, ask them to stop using it um, because we know that these things can be problematic for monarchs and other pollinators. The other thing I, I want to um, point out is that we really encourage people to plant um, native milkweed and to avoid planting tropical milkweed. Tropical milkweed is most likely to be found in, in nurseries. It's a widely sold um, milkweed it is easy to grow and propagate and it's beautiful and has lovely flowers and um, grows generally year-round in most places. So it's a really attractive plant for people to have in their gardens, but it can be really problematic for monarchs. Um, the, the report here that I have in the middle is from Project Monarch Health, which um, is a community science project aimed at better understanding monarch diseases and parasites. Um, in North America, and 
they have found that uh, the rates of disease are higher in monarch butterflies in areas where there are non-migratory monarch populations that have been established where tropical milkweed grows. So in places like Florida and in Texas in the Gulf, there are populations of this tropical milkweed that never dies back like native milkweeds do in the winter. And so there are milkweeds available year round for the monarchs to use. And what happens is they get they get trapped essentially. They're like, oh, there's milkweed here, so I'm gonna continue to breed and they, they don't migrate anymore. And what happens is that because the monarch butterflies don't move and aren't leaving and the milkweed doesn't die back is that these diseases build up. And so um, we have, there's a lot of data now and a lot of research that's been published um, showing that these tropical milkweeds are problematic for a variety of reasons. And um, so where, climate is, is relatively mild, um, tropical milkweed can be a really big problem. So we really encourage people to, to plant um, native milkweed instead. Um, I pointed out uh, butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa earlier, is one of the most common, more or more common uh, native milkweed species in New Mexico. And it is equally as beautiful as tropical milkweed, but it's also an awesome native plant. So I highly recommend um, seeking out or butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa, instead of tropical milkweed, because it's just as beautiful, it's just as great to plant in your garden or in a natural area, um, and it doesn't pose as many risks as tropical milkweed. The other thing I want to point out is that it's really important to, when we talk about conservation, is that we focus on um, what will actually benefit the monarchs the most, and, and that's really keeping monarchs wild. So we want to improve habitat for monarchs, out in the landscape rather than um, rearing large numbers of monarchs um, because we don't we know that it carries risks and is not a recommended conservation strategy so it carries risks because it can increase disease um, rates and spread um, and so we know that raising monarchs can be really enjoyable and useful for some research projects and just personally enjoyable, um, whether you're doing it for yourself because you have monarchs that lay eggs in your yard or as an educational tool. We, we understand that that's um, a really valuable and satisfying experience, but we just don't advise doing this on a large scale because it's not really contributing to monarch conservation. So we suggest that if you are going to do it, to not really raise more than 10, um, only collect caterpillars locally from the wild, never buy or ship monarchs. Um, and if you know of a local place in New Mexico that does it, tell them to not do it anymore. It's a really terrible practice. Um, keep the number, like I said, under 10 if you can. And if you are going to rear to keep your containers clean and then participate in community science. And what I mean by that is that if you're going to rear butterflies from eggs that were laid in your yard, um, to participate in Project Monarch Health. So you can contact Project Monarch Health and they'll send you a kit so you can test your butterflies to see if they have any diseases, for example, uh, or any parasites. Um, and that's really valuable data. And so if you're gonna rear, it's just kind of another fun thing to add on um, if you're gonna rear things from your garden. Um, and then that way you're also contributing to science so that we can better understand rates of disease and, and parasites uh, wherever you are. Um, and in New Mexico, there's very little data, so, um, I encourage you to participate in Project Monarch Health. Project Monarch Health, you don't have to use reared butterflies. You can also test wild butterflies as well. So like I said, participating in community science is one of the main ways that we can all contribute to monarch conservation um, all over North America, not just for the Western population, um, but in particular in New Mexico, because we still know very little about monarchs in New Mexico. Even though we have quite a bit of data, we still need more. Um, in particular, we need to better understand migratory pathways in New Mexico, what habitat types are being used, which times of the year, um, which areas are hotspots, which areas we should prioritize for conservation, where we should restore habitat. There's just so much that we still have to learn about monarchs in New Mexico. So um, one of the best ways that we can do that is by everyone contributing data that can. Um, the more eyes we have on the ground, the better we are at our to better understand where monarchs are and to, to target conservation efforts. There are so many great conservation or community science projects for monarchs in North America. 
Um, I have a few listed here. The Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, I think I mentioned that earlier, is a Monarch Joint Venture uh, program that is nationwide, and it's a monitoring program um, to monitor monarch populations and their habitat throughout its breeding range in North America. Um, Journey North um, has or primarily tracks the monarch migration, but you can report um, both milkweed and monarchs to their website. They have fantastic online real-time migration maps that you can go look at right now to see um, how monarchs are moving towards New Mexico um, from northern areas as the migration gets underway right now. Um, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project uh, is, a, is a project that has, um, they have online training and data sheets that you can download to better understand the number of generations. Um, in a particular area of monarch butterflies. So they have really great uh, monitoring tools. Um, and then you can contribute your data. And then like I already mentioned, Project Monarch Health, um, which is a way to track the different parasites um, and diseases of monarch butterflies. Another big um, community science project is called the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. I helped manage this online database and it, um, was set up as a crowdsourcing way to develop or to compile data of monarchs and milkweed in the West to guide conservation efforts. In particular, the data was used to develop habitat suitability models in the Western United States for monarchs and milkweed. Um, but this online database, anybody can participate. All you have to do is to um, go to the website, sign up for an account, and then you can submit your photos of either a monarch or a milkweed um and and then submit it and then you can see it show up on the map um and it's it's pretty it's pretty exciting um it also has an id guide so you can submit a milkweed photo and even if you don't know what species it is there's a, a id wizard that will walk you through it so you can hopefully um figure out which species that it is um the website also has a variety of other resources it includes the monarch nectar guides that i mentioned earlier um, the milkweed uh, guides for roadsides, um, best management practices for monarchs in the Western United States, um, and, and lots of tips and tricks for identifying and photographing monarch butterflies for contributing to community science projects. It, there are also links to most of the community science projects I just mentioned too. Um, so like I said, we have very little data on monarchs in New Mexico. We have more on milkweeds. Um, and so I encourage everybody, if they can, to report any, any monarch observations they have. And it can be old, too. If you have a photo from a few years ago that's dated and you know the location, you can, can sub still submit that. Um, so like I said, yeah, please, please report any observations you have. Um, normally, when we give a workshop, we would actually have a field component um, where we would all go out together and look at milkweed plants and document them and report them to the mapper. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do that today. Um, so I encourage you all, if you, if you can, under current restrictions for COVID in your area, go out and, and look at, at milkweed plants. You can practice and go look for eggs and caterpillars or adults and then report them to the milkweed mapper. Um, we also, this, this online database also tracks uh, monarch nectaring. So we still are, are trying to learn more about what plant species are most important for monarch butterflies for nectar resources. Um, in particular, the species that are most important during the migration. So whether that's spring or fall. So right now, fall, if you go out and you see a monarch nectaring on a plant, we would love to know that information because the more data we have on what monarchs are using, during this time of the year, the better equipped we are to develop conservation um, efforts to plant more of those plants, for example, or get more of those plants available in commercial seed production so that there's seed and plants available for, um, for land managers to be able to plant more of those plants in the ground. So you can report a monarch adult on a flower and then say what flower it was on, and that is super, super valuable data that we need, um, especially for New Mexico. Um, the website also allows you to download the existing data set of milkweed and monarch records so that you can uh, download and see where milkweed and monarchs have been reported in your area. Um, it also, like I said, includes really cool milkweed profiles. You can even download a specific milkweed profile as a PDF and it's like a little mini guide for that plant, shows the range map for the plant, 
ID tools, what elevation it grows at, sort of leaf arrangement on the plant, what the flowers look like, flower color, and includes pictures. Um, so you could create your own little mini guide of, of milkweed species that you're most likely to encounter in the field. Um, and then it also has ID tips for how to identify adult monarchs, and it includes all of those um, pictures that I showed earlier of the lookalike, so the queen butterfly and the viceroy butterfly, which both look very similar to monarchs. The pictures to tell the difference between the two are on this website as well. So it just has great resources for um, monarch conservation ID, milkweed ID, and all of that. So I encourage you to check it out and contribute data if you can. Another big thing that um, is coming up too in New Mexico is uh, tagging. So there are a variety of Western monarch tagging programs. Um, and like I said, these tagging programs are where you go out and you net a butterfly and then you stick a sticker on its hind wing, as you can see in the picture here. And that sticker has a unique ID on it. And that unique ID is then recorded on the data sheet. You record the date and location of where you tagged your butterfly, and then you let it go and you really hope, you cross your fingers and hope someone else will see that butterfly somewhere and then report it back to the tagging program so that we can better understand where monarchs are going from which areas. So like I said before, we have not yet had a tagged butterfly from New Mexico go to California, but who knows, maybe this is the year and someone will tag a butterfly in New Mexico and it will show up in California, which would be really, really cool. Um, the main program for New Mexico that does tagging is called the Southwest Monarch Study. Um, and uh, Gail Morris with the Southwest Monarch Study provided these slides for today. Uh, and you can see her region uh, for the Southwest, Mo Southwest Monarch Study tagging program is all the area in blue. So it includes all of New Mexico, Arizona, part of Colorado, Utah. Nevada and southeastern California. And so you can contact Southwest Monarch Study and they'll send you those little stickers in the mail along with data sheets. And then you can go out and look for monarchs. And if you find some, you can try to net them with a butterfly net and hopefully carefully stick a sticker on them and tag them and let them go and participate in the fun. Um, the peak migration windows coming up in New Mexico right now are um, for these different regions, you can see this, the different dates. So primarily peaking sort of mid-September through mid-October uh, in most of these places. And so this would be like the best time is coming up in another couple weeks um, to go out and, and see butterflies migrating back towards Mexico um, or maybe California, who knows, depending on where you are. Um, if you're west of the Continental Divide, you in northwestern New Mexico, you could potentially tag a butterfly that could go to California, you never know. Um, but anyway, so these are the peak times. So yeah, like I said, you can contact Southwest Monarch Study and they will send you the tags and data sheets and you can uh, go out and hopefully tag some butterflies. Southwest Monarch Study also has tons of other um, information available on their website about um, milkweed and monarch conservation in Arizona and New Mexico. And they've been doing work there in, in Arizona and New Mexico for a long time. Um, so I encourage you to check out their website too. They have really great resources for finding native milkweed plants, um, nurseries that have native milkweed. Sometimes they have um, milkweed sales. They also work on, um, or they also host workshops, um, pre-COVID anyway. Um, Hopefully in the future when we can all hold workshops again in person there that you can um, Stay tuned with Southwest Monarch Study and hopefully maybe attend one of their workshops in the future. Um, they also monitor milkweed populations for monarch breeding uh, identify breeding habitat for monarchs in the southwest uh, and in, encourage establishment of monarch habitat. So they've planted a lot of milkweed in, in Arizona in particular um, for monarchs um, and they're just a really great program that I encourage you to check out. Here's an example map of, of the monarchs that have been tagged in the Southwest, including New Mexico, um, and where they've gone. So you can see for New Mexico, there are only two tag recoveries of all, even though there have been quite, quite a few butterflies tagged in New Mexico, there are only two recoveries of butterflies and both went to central Mexico. So, um, but you can see from this map that some of them 
from Arizona have gone to California. There have been 26 total tag recoveries um, from Arizona into California and 24 from Arizona to Mexico. Um, and Gail Morris of Southwest Monarch Study was kind enough to provide this map and data today um, for this webinar. Um, and so you can see that there's a mixing. Like I said, the Eastern population of monarchs is generally east of the continental divide, which kind of straddles the uh, west side of New Mexico there. Um, and so you can see that there's mixing of the east and west population. So in the west in Arizona, butterflies can go to either California or to New Mexico. And that's the same, um, we can assume that's the same too when they come back up from Mexico. So butterflies coming back up from Mexico will come into Arizona, breed and expand throughout the West and their progeny will then go back to California potentially that next year. Um, and so you can see how, how there's mixing of the population there. Like I said, here's the contact information for Southwest Monarch Study and their website. Um, I encourage you to check it out. If you're interested in tagging, um, you can contact them. And like I said, they will send you tags. I hope some of you attending today get to go out and do this. I wish I was in New Mexico and could go out and look for monarchs myself uh, and try to tag some butterflies. It's really fun, although very challenging. You wouldn't think it's so challenging to chase butterflies with a net, but let me tell you, monarchs are very fast and difficult to catch. So like I said, we can all hopefully contribute to monarch conservation by just getting involved, whether that's identifying and protecting monarch habitat in your community, planting native nectar sources and milkweeds where it's appropriate, um, whether that's in your backyard, on your balcony, um, in a community garden, uh, in, in your city landscaping, um, you can participate in monarch community science, local conservation programs, support local and organic agriculture, um, encourage local nurseries to stop using insecticides on their on their plants um, and spread the word so encourage your family and friends in your local community to participate as well you can also get your community involved um, one big program is called bee city usa um, they're dedicated to enabling communities to raise awareness and enhance habitat for pollinators and as you can see, Albuquerque, New Mexico is a bee city, which is really cool. Um, and all of the uh, red dots on the map or red stars are bee cities. And I think the black ones are bee campuses. So university or schools that have decided to become bee cities. And you basically pledge to follow a certain number of guidelines that enhances habitat for pollinators um, and raises awareness for them. So that's one way is you can encourage your local city to become a bee city. Um, you can find more information on the Bee City website. Another way is to get your city to take the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which is a National Wildlife Federation pledge, um, where cities and municipalities and communities come together to create habitat for the monarch butterfly and pollinators, and then educate um, community members about how they can make a difference, whether it's at their home or at the community level. And New Mexico does not have a single city that has taken the mayor's monarch pledge. So if you live in a city in New Mexico and you wanna to try to encourage your local mayor to take the mayor's monarch pledge, there are a certain number of um, action items that a city must follow to uh, be part of the mayor's monarch pledge. And you can learn all about that by searching for the mayor's monarch pledge online. So Xerces has, I've mentioned a ton of different resources today throughout the webinar for monarch and milkweed conservation um, in North America. And here are just a few. I encourage you to check out Xerces uh, website to find more resources. Um, also the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, like I mentioned, that website has lots of resources. We will also be sending out a link tomorrow after the webinar to all participants with links to some of the main resources that I mentioned today so that you'll get uh, a list of those. But this, this shows um, some of the main ones, um, including Managing for Monarchs in the West, which is a large, um, pretty lengthy, uh, detailed best management practices document for conserving the monarch butterfly and its habitat in the Western US. The Xerces Society has uh, great books, Gardening for Butterflies, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees, Attracting Native Pollinators. There are the monarch nectar plant guides that are specific to regions including the Southwest, like the one I have pictured here, 
And then there are uh, a variety of different milkweed guides. The ones I have, the one I have pictured here is one that's specific to roadsides. Um, and then there's the milkweeds conservation practitioners guide. So if you're uh, uh, interested in restoration, um, the conservation practitioners guide really goes over detailed how to grow um, milkweed plants, how to collect seed, all of that detailed information. And then the milkweed seed finder, like I mentioned earlier, is a way to locate um, nurseries in your region that offer native milkweed plants, whether that's seeds or plants or plugs. Um, so that's a, a, a short list of resources available. Additional resources, Monarch Joint Venture is a nonprofit that um, is a partnership of federal and state agencies and non-governmental organizations, businesses, and academic programs that are all working together to protect the monarch migration across the United States. And they have a great list of publications and resources available on their website for monarch conservation. I highly recommend checking that out too if you need additional resources. And um, one program specific to uh, New Mexico is Institute for Applied Ecology has a Southwest program that's based in Santa Fe. Um, and they uh, are focused on improving the supply of ecologically appropriate native plant materials for restoration in New Mexico um, for the recovery of rare plants and butterflies, including the monarch. Um, so they are a great uh, resource as well. I know that in the past they've teamed up with Steve Carey, who's a lepidopterist in New Mexico, to do tagging butterfly tagging of monarchs. Um, so they, they may have uh, future events um, where you could participate in monarch conservation. They also have really great native plant curriculum that is geared towards high school students that can be downloaded for free. And it includes native plant ID for new, that's specific to New Mexico. And it is pretty awesome. Um, I ch I've checked it out and it's not just for high school students. I would say anybody that's interested in learning about native plants in New Mexico and how to ID plants and all of that to check it out. It's a great resource that's free. And um, I just want to thank all of the Xerces supporters, whether it's donors or members in particular, I want to thank the Carol Petrie Foundation for supporting this webinar and a lot of our work that's in New Mexico. Um, and I also just want to point out that donors really make all the work that Xerces does possible. So if you're interested, if you're not a member yet, if you want to become a member of Xerces, um, please visit uh, xerces.org slash donate. Um, and with that, thank you so much for joining today. I hope, I hope you learned a little about monarchs and milkweed in New Mexico. And now hopefully you've entered lots and lots of questions that I will answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I definitely learned a lot <laughs> from everything you had to tell us. Um, we got a lot of great questions. I've answered a few um, by okay. text, but we, so there's a couple themes I wanted to ask specifically about. A lot of people okay. are interested in the, where is the divide line between the Eastern and the uh, Western monarch populations? Would you say the continental divide is really a decent um, kind of borderline or do you think it's a little more blurred? Could it be more, more in Arizona or more in New Mexico? Yeah, I think it's a fairly blurred line. I mean, generally when we talk about it, we say it's the continental divide. Um, but like I said, there's really, there is definitely mixing between the Eastern and Western populations. So, I, I try to think less of it as a demarcated line between the populations so much as it's the way that we can talk about conservation efforts are different for the Western US than the Eastern US. So it's more discerning between those two things rather than discerning between a true population boundary, if that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, there's, um, it would definitely be really cool to get a tagged monarch. Uh, Wouldn't it? From New Mexico and find it in California one day. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you speak a little bit more about tropical milkweed? And it's, so there's, um, you know, if it dies out up north, is it still a problem? Like what, what are the problems it has if it's more in the northern United States? And then 
Um, will monarchs use it if there are other native milkweeds around? Where do you know if it's used um, by more monarchs in certain parts of the US? Is it used in Mexico by monarchs living in Central or when they are in Central uh, North America? What, what, what do you know um, about tropical milkweed? <laughs> Oh, that's a lot of questions about tropical no. The first one was, um, if it dies back in the winter, is it still okay? And I would say, in general, yes. I think Cersei's stance is that we would encourage you to have native milkweed if all possible. Um, if it does die back in the winter, um, or if it doesn't die back and you just can't bear to pull it out of your yard, you want to keep it, um, to cut it back every single way so that you don't end up with that problem of, um, a buildup of diseases, um, particularly OE. Um, let's see, the next question was whether or not, I think monarchs will, so tropical milkweed does grow native, I believe, in Mexico. And I think butter, the monarchs, I think, have been used, do use it in Mexico. Um, what, was, what was one of the other questions? I think the other one was like, are, uh, if there are other native milkweeds around, will monarchs oh. prefer that over tropical milkweed? That, I don't know I don't if that's know. easily known. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think monarchs will use any milkweed that's available. Um, I, I think I've heard anecdotal evidence of people that have tropical milkweed in their yard and monarchs do really like tropical milkweed if it's available. But I do know that, um, I feel like I have heard from some people that have native milkweed and monarchs will prefer that. So there's different toxicity levels of different milkweed species too, so it sort of depends on which native milkweed you have. Is tropical milkweed relatively toxic? Um, okay, yeah, our, uh, Ray Morans, one of our colleagues, he sent us in the chat that monarchs really love tropical milkweed and they've yeah. been using it in Latin America for thousands of years, so thanks Ray. Thanks. Yeah, your thanks, tropical, <laughs> your tropical <laughs> knowledge. Um, so uh, one question we got was, if you have a garden, um, how many individual milkweed plants do you think you need to attract and support monarchs? Ooh, that's a really good question. I would say any like a species dependent too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because depending on the species. Some species grow multiple stems and are really um, quite large and some plants are single stemmed and, and not as big. So yeah, I guess it would depend if we're talking about plants versus stems. Um, but in general, I think, you know, one monarch caterpillar can consume quite a bit of vegetation just to complete its life cycle. So you wanna have a decent milkweed. I don't know, I can't give an exact um, number, but I know some people that just have a handful of milkweed plants in their yard and monarchs will use it and a few monarchs will breed and then just move on. So even if you only have space to plant a few milkweeds, it's still better than nothing at all. Great. Um, do you know anything about queen butterflies? So they're a butterfly that's in the same genus as monarchs. Are they experiencing a population decline? That's a really good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I have not heard anything um, about decline, species, but you would expect that they, they are a migratory species. So I don't know, um, you know, that may make them less at risk because they aren't undergoing that long distance migration as much as monarchs. And so they may not face the same stressors as the monarch butterfly and may not be in decline, but I don't know the answer to that. So I will try to look that up. And yeah, yeah I, I tried to Google it really fast, but it, it's hard to find. Um, yeah, something that's not about monarchs decline. Yeah, um, <laughs> differentiate that from queens. But yeah, I know you know um, many many species of insects are declining, and queens could definitely fall yeah. into that number of different insect species. Definitely, yeah. Um, so I had someone ask about uh, temperature fluctuations. They live on the Front Range in Colorado and they have um, big temperature shifts from like the 90s into the 30s in one day. Right. 
And how do you know how monarchs are able to survive such sudden shifts in temperature? My personal experience in the Great Basin is similar. So at higher elevation sites in the Great Basin, there are similar temperature shifts. And I've seen a lot of monarch breeding in those areas where it'll be like 95 degrees in the day and drop to 40 at night. And they seem to be doing just fine. Now, I think that the issue is in those areas is that your, your breeding season is probably going to be much shorter in areas where you have those wild, wild, or like wide shifts in temperature because you're probably at a higher elevation and so you're more likely to dip into freezing temperatures and the freezing temperatures I think are the more limiting factor than the high temperatures. So I've seen monarch caterpillars cruising around on a milkweed eating milkweed vegetation at like 106 degrees. So they don't seem to be as affected by heat as much as they would be by freezing temps. So depending on where you live, if you live in a place where, you know, it's going to start freezing in late August, early September, your breeding season is probably going to be limited. Monarchs will know to leave that area. Um, but that's a really good question. Yeah, great. Um, so we have a participant from Florida. And they were wondering about, I'm not sure how much you know about the Eastern population, because I know you are focused on Western monarchs. But um, they were wondering if those Florida populations, do they migrate to Mexico? Do they overwinter in Florida? Um, what, what is the situation with those Florida populations? You are right. I do focus more on the Western population, but what I understand is that I think that a lot of, there are, are non-migratory populations in Florida, but I do think that in parts of Florida, I think some butterflies still do migrate. Right. Um, our colleague Ray has the answer. Yes. Um, <laughs> does that mean they do both? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thanks again, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, let's see. I've got got a lot of really great questions um, that I've kind of already answered and just sent links to people, mostly about the Western monarch milkweed mapper and how you can see, um, you know, like lie or you know uh recent sightings of monarchs and milkweeds across the west mm -hmm. and all the different species that of milkweed that monarchs are munching on um let's see what else is here um i think that's about it um unless you have anything you would like to add I'm just reading through the questions really quick to see if there's any. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we answered most of them unless anybody has any last minute questions they want to type in really quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some folks talk about milkweed sightings in New Mexico. Someone thinks they saw some uh, Asclepias speciosa, the showy milkweed, along the Rio Grande and along the Pecos. And um, I've definitely seen showy milkweed in, in places like that, in wetter places and higher elevation. Um, yeah, I should have I should have included that. That species is, is common. I was just trying to include the species we have the most records for. But showy milkweed is definitely one. Um, that's that's the in the center photo of this last slide here. Um, but it's definitely pretty common in New Mexico as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Subverta Salida is just everywhere here, you can imagine. <laughs> it's just yeah. all over the place. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so migrating monarchs in New Mexico in September, October right now, are they laying eggs? If there's milkweed available, um, some monarchs may still be laying eggs, yes. Yeah, yeah, I know um, uh, the ecologist at the Los Alamos National Lab, she 
actually uh, is working with the lab in their mowing schedule and trying to prevent them from mowing milkweed this time of year because she is she does find eggs on uh, milkweed up near Los Alamos this time of year. So, yeah. Those yeah, and I know. I know with uh, Gail Morris and Southwest Monarch Study has reported um, this time of year too, sort of like an uptick in, in breeding because so in Arizona in particular, they have like really hot summer temperatures and they'll see kind of like a summer lull where they won't see as much breeding and then it'll pick up as the temperature starts to drop because there's still milk available. So it seems very likely that in New Mexico there would be a similar phenomenon. So. Um, it isn't just a hard and fast line. Oh, it's September. The butterflies are going to fly straight to Mexico and pass over all the milkweed. There will still be some breeding that happens this time of year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always there's always a blur line with yeah. the ecology <laughs> and timing and borders. <laughs> Great. Um, that was well, a really good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good question. Um, Let's see, are you connected with Dr. David James program where, I think that's in Washington or Oregon, where um, prisoners raise larvae and are tagged and released. I know that's an issue with raising uh, or rearing monarchs, um, but if, uh, you did mention that if it's done in smaller numbers, it's a little more sustainable. Yeah, we're not um, directly connected with David James's program. Um, he's had quite a few recoveries uh, from Washington State and Oregon, Idaho, Utah, um, going to California overwintering sites, um, but we're not directly tied with them, so I can't really speak to the work that they do or the program that someone mentioned about raising larvae and with prisoners and tagging and releasing. I'm not super familiar with that, so I can't really speak to that. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. Well, I think that's about it. Um, I want to say thank you to Ray for jumping in <laughs> and answering our questions about Eastern monarchs. And thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your knowledge and doing lots of research on New Mexico and monarchs in the Southwest. I appreciate your, your time you spent to uh, do this webinar. Yeah, and thanks to everybody for joining in today. Yeah, and this will be available on the Xerces uh, Society YouTube channel. So here in a few days after we do a little bit of editing, um, check the Xerces YouTube channel and this will be um, uploaded and you can share it with others who might find this interesting. So thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate your time and I hope you all have a great day.